I'm Dr. Anthony Cave, and I want to share with you what 2024 is bringing us for cancer risk in the population that used to be at the lowest risk of cancer. That's right. That's young people. Young people used to be the ones who we didn't even have to think about cancer, but it's coming for the young. And many of these cancers are the preventable forms, fortunately, but young people. We all know that young people are invincible, right? Like Superman. They haven't necessarily had some of the life experiences that some of my older patients have had, like here in the operating room. And it breaks my heart when young patients come to the OR and they've been diagnosed with cancer. And their whole life, maybe they thought that they were afraid of the needles or maybe the medications losing control when you're going under anesthesia, but it's not until they're on the table, like what you see here, this is actually the donut, that their heads rest in. It's not until that point when sometimes, no joke, there's silent tears that come down and they have this inevitable concern, this inevitable thought about why did this happen? And it's, Certainly, it's hard when you're the anesthesiologist and you're the last person that that patient sees before they go under. The last thing that they hear, the last thing that you see from that patient. Why did this happen? You go from being invincible as a young person suddenly to having cancer and now being on the operating room table for it. So why does this happen is what I want you to know. What is the lip service that our broken healthcare system puts out as a narrative around it? And... I want you to be able to advocate for yourself and your loved ones to hopefully prevent the risks as far as you can to ending up here on the operating room table with someone like myself for cancer. So first off, I want to make sure that when people, you know that when patients ask, why did this happen? We don't always know why this happens, but we do have suspicions. Most importantly, though, when someone is here in the operating room with me, they're in this strange, unfamiliar room. It's cold. They're about to lose complete control of their body. They're going to be connected to the ventilator behind me. This is not the time to be shifting blame, right? I'm not about saying anyone's a special snowflake. I think everyone deserves to be empowered to advocate. But this has to be done in a contextually appropriate way, compassionately. The operating room is not the time. The time is now before things happen, before you end up with that diagnosis of cancer and it's no longer something that can be easily cured with a small excision, for example, like a colonoscopy. We're going to talk about that. So we're going to talk about specifically colorectal cancer and cervical cancer, the two cancers that are increasing in prevalence, meaning there are more diagnoses than ever before in young patients. And before we jump into that, just as a quick reminder, if you appreciate me coming on here uh, after surgery here and learning something new, please hit that like button, subscribe to keep up with all the lives and consider joining the live access. The link is below where you can ask more personalized questions. Remember, we will answer your questions in the live Q&A at the end. But first, the colorectal cancer and cervical cancer. We usually abbreviate colorectal cancer as CRC. And these two organs are the shields of our body. And these are the two organ systems that are developing cancer more than any other organ in young individuals. I call them the shields of the body, not because they're literal shields, but because they are the first line of event, defense to external toxins. That means the carcinogens in our environment, for example, and there's many of them that we either know or strongly suspect will lead to cancer in young or old, but something happened in the 1950s that is causing young people to seemingly be exposed to these more. Whether it's processed or cured meats, especially red meat, we know there are nitroso compounds in these that can be carcinogenic, and the gut is one of the first things that's exposed to these carcinogens. Maybe it's the microplastics in the environment. In 2024, we now have growing data about the accumulation of microplastics in the environment from all sorts of uh, improper recycling or improper waste of these plastics that have seeped in our water and our food. They're ubiquitous, unfortunately. There's always the risk of infections. 
maybe some infections are now more common, or maybe the immune system of younger patients is not able to clear out these infections. Remember just last week, we talked about H. pylori for stomach cancer. That's different than the colorectal cancer specifically, but certainly we know that HPV, human papillomavirus, remember, is the virus that causes most uterine cancers. Now, diet is a big one because that's the first thing that your gut sees. And it's not just the red meats. It's all these processed meats that no one talks about, especially your doctor probably doesn't tell you about processed meat. We'll talk about that at the end. But another thing that even if you take out the effect of the shield from the outside world, the inside world of your body is also changing at an alarming rate across the United States. And yeah, that's specifically the rates of obesity and overweightness. Now, what you probably don't know is that obesity itself is a risk factor for many cancers. It's believed that one in five cancers is caused by either obesity or its associated conditions. I'm talking non-alcoholic steatohepatitis or uh, fatty liver disease, that's NASH for short, maybe complications of diabetes, but the ongoing inflammation that being fat causes, and I'm not fat shaming, absolutely not, but I'm pointing out in a compassionate way that we need to recognize that these are known risk factors, lack of physical activity and overweightness. The increased inflammation from the adipocytes, which are the fat cells in your body, fuel the body into forming new blood vessels, letting certain cancerous cells proliferate, impairing perhaps the immune system that ordinarily can identify cancerous cells and snip them off. Maybe they evade the surveillance of your immune system. Once again, not fat shaming but compassionately recognizing that there's a good news here, that there isn't much that we can do to reduce our risks of many cancers, including colorectal cancer and certainly uterine cancer and many other cancers as well. But we're talking today about colorectal cancer. It's partly from everything we talked about, the outside world that hits your GI tract and then the inside environment of your body. Now, specifically, if we're going to look at cervical cancer, we know that tobacco and alcohol can play a role, but we also have to acknowledge the role of genetics for both of these. Specifically for colorectal cancer, it's believed that about 30-ish percent of all the young patients with colorectal cancer actually have a genetic mutation that's leading to it, whether it's Lynch syndrome, HMPCC, FAP, there's numerous hereditary conditions. So if you're a young individual, and you have the genetic predisposition, and you have these other risk factors that we're talking about, you need to, you need to speak up. You need the right screening. Because like I said at the beginning, we can screen for colorectal cancer and uterine cancer. It's not like we're completely helpless against these cancers the way we are in some ways to pancreatic cancer, for example, sometimes ovarian cancer. These are challenging cancers without good screening. There's good news here for young people, but you need to be educated and you need to advocate for yourself. And our healthcare system certainly does not do that. We are all too happy to let you come into the operating room when it's kind of too late to do the small interventions. Nothing wrong with surgery. This can be life-saving, but it comes at a toll, psychologically, physically, financially, spiritually, interpersonally. We want to do the preventive things, which we can do. And young people need to know this. Like I said earlier, there's something about the lifestyle that's changed. The genetics are a big deal, like I said, but it doesn't explain everything. And our genetics not have changed fast enough for this whopping increase in young adult cancers to be explained by genetics alone, because our genes don't change that fast. Something happened in the 1950s, I suspect, from a collection of what we've already talked about, but there's a couple other things that are very curious. One is in utero exposures. In utero exposures mean before you're ever born, when you're still in your mother's uterus. We believe that there might be certainly some hereditary factors that are passed on that affect the child. Certainly, certainly in maternal stressors and high cortisol levels can, blast, can cross the placental barrier and reach the fetus, whether that causes cancer or not, we don't know. But if cortisol can pass through, what other molecules can pass through 
It's not just stress hormones, it's probably also environmental toxins. What about breastfeeding? Breastfeeding is very curious because a recent study showed that individuals that are breastfed have a higher risk of colorectal cancer. Now, this is very unusual because usually breastfeeding has many benefits. Now, we don't want to necessarily discourage women from breastfeeding, but we do need to look more closely at this association. As of now, we believe that the benefits of breastfeeding outweigh this potential associated risk with cancer in the child. Time will tell as this is studied. What can you do though, if you're no longer a breastfeeding infant and you're a young adult, is you need to get screened. As you know, colonoscopies are the gold standard for screening for colorectal cancer. If a polyp is found early enough, it can be snipped and that's it. It doesn't have a chance to grow because it's completely removed from your body. That means no surgery, hopefully, no chemotherapy, no radiation. In the case of cervical cancer, those Papanicolaou smears, named after the physician Papanicolaou, those pap smears can detect early cervical cancers to prevent them continuing to grow and grow and grow. The problem is that our healthcare system doesn't allow, at least for colonoscopies, to be done in those individuals under 45 years old. At least it's not an official recommendation. You probably, there's not going to be any insurance reimbursement anytime soon. This is a challenging situation, which is why if you have these risk factors, especially a family history, you need to advocate for yourself. Hopefully insurance will cover a surveillance colonoscopy, even if you're under 45 years old. Now, luckily, the age of routine colonoscopy screening dropped from 50 to 45 just a couple years ago. Maybe we'll drop it lower and get insurance to pay for it and save some lives and a lot of hardship, a lot of suffering in my patients. I hope that you learn something new to advocate for yourself if you or a loved one has these risk factors. In the case of cervical cancer, that HPV vaccine is actually very effective. The cohort of individuals who, has, who have received the HPV vaccine actually do not show that higher increase in cervical cancer. They show a lower prevalence of cervical cancer. No, it's not a perfect vaccine. No, it does not prevent against all forms of human papillomavirus. Some viruses can make it through and they can cause cervical cancer, but it sure appears to be doing a good job at cutting the risk. I know vaccines are a charge topic. I'll leave it at that. But if you have risk factors, try to cut them out. And if a vaccine you feel is right for you, certainly talk to your doctor about that. But I want to take time to answer your questions in the live now. Just as a reminder, if you did learn something new, do please hit that like button and share what you learned with others. And I want to answer your comments. I see a ton of them have come in. Uh, so crazy how doctors tell you you are too young for a colonoscopy at 40. Yes, that is a problem. I agree. I hope that now you appreciate why that is not likely to be the case moving forward as doctors get educated in the increased prevalence of colorectal cancer. And yes, get your colonoscopies. We'll have a whole video one day on the anesthesia that's used for colonoscopies. I'm sure you'll find it very informative. Um, oh, well, I'm sorry to hear about your 27-year-old son, Jenny. That's, that's very sad. I, I'm sorry. I hope they have the right support in dealing with I'm having an EGD and colonoscopy coming up. That is both the upper endoscopy, where they put the camera down your esophagus, and then the lower colonoscopy, as you know. That's on spring break, uh, diehard school, man. I'm sorry to hear that you're bleeding out of the rectum. I'm happy that you're getting it checked out. I hope that, uh, Raymond, I hope that that gets worked out for you and that you don't have anything concerning there. At what age do they recommend pap smears to know, uh, or when are they no longer needed is the question. Uh, Debbie, you have to ask your doctor. There depends on past history of abnormal pap smears. Uh, a couple variables that go into that. You want to discuss that with your doctor. A very, very good question. Do they cover most of your butt when they do the colonoscopy? No, they don't, actually. Um, that's because they need to have access to the, the scope, that colonoscope as it's coming in and out. But we do keep you modest on the front side. Very good question. Lori had a colonoscopy today. I'm really happy to hear that. Thumbs up back to you. I hope that there are no polyps that were found. I'd like kindly to get your inputs on the prevalence of CRC secondary to VPH infection uh, in young males. 
Christian, that's a good question. I am not familiar with the association, uh, the increased prevalence from BPH. Sorry, I wish I knew more about that, but thank you for raising that important question. Are diets and food and drink a real cause of concern? I would say so. Have they definitively been correlated causally to one of these cancers? Not that I'm aware of, but my principle with my patients is to not be a guinea pig, if possible, if reasonably possible. You don't want to detach from society, but you probably want to also not be that guinea pig. Gazer says, Western fast food diet, say no more. Yes. <laughs> Full of processed and refined foods and carcinogens, I agree. Tammy Pearson, I have Yao, Lupus, Raynaud, Sjogren's. I have run high fevers. Um, well, I am sorry about all these autoimmune conditions. The breastfeeding correlation might end up being something that does have a, uh, a causal risk with colorectal cancer, with other cancers, but we don't know yet. Just an association for now. I'm happy. I hope that your daughter is doing well. Uh, <laughs> Heidi, <laughs> um, it is, it is hanging out there. Now, gastroparesis, Alibaba, we had a whole uh, video on this. We talked about Ozempic. Very, very painful experience. I hope that you don't have it, but if you do, I hope that you do, uh, you have been seen by your gastroenterologist to rule out reversible causes of gastroparesis. And Rachel, so I should I get a colonoscopy more often than, than every two years? My mom uh, at stage four at age 58, and you had your first tubular adenoma at 43. I will leave that discussion up to you and your gastroenterologist. But Rachel, you're on the right track if you have any family history or if you have any personal history of polyps. And depending on the size of the polyps, you might need to get your colonoscopies more frequently. And I am very, very happy that you're on that. Is there an increase in kids with brain tumors? I'm not aware of that, uh, but that's a very good question for us to talk about on a future live. When will they come up with a better colonoscopy prep? Ah. For those of you who don't know what Aaron is referring to, the colonoscopy prep is usually the worst part of the procedure because when, when you're actually getting the colonoscopy, you're getting medications. If you're fortunate enough to have an anesthesiologist, you're getting propofol. You're asleep for the colonoscopy or the esophagogastroduodenoscopy, the EGD. It's the prep that's by far the most, most uncomfortable. Hey, <laughs> that's so kind of you. Hey, if you're liking something and learning uh, new stuff here, please hit that like button to support what I do. It means a lot. Thank you. I viewed the film where the actress had a colonoscopy, Art Chem. I don't know what film that is, but that sounds very um, frightening. What movie was that? Can you let me know below? Uh, the amosurf, I'm scared of getting cancer because my colon can't actually move anything along, but nobody uh, recommending a colonoscopy. Should I advocate for myself? You should talk with your doctor, depending on your age and your risk factors. Absolutely. Absolutely. So virtual colonoscopies, you don't want uh, anesthesia for the procedure. I understand. Unfortunately, you do need to have the prep right? Did you not have to take the prep and clear everything out for the virtual colonoscopy? L let, let me know. I'm very curious because I want other people to know as well. Lab grown meat. Is it a concern? We don't know yet. It's very, very early. Very, very early. Good question though. Lizzie, it's hard to cover the cheeks fully unless you have a hole to put the, colonos the colonoscope through in and out. I don't want to make any vulgar hands and signals here, but you know what I mean. Um, Perhaps you could have a cutout. I just have never seen one of these, but maybe they exist in some parts of the world. Um, it's often, we, we keep you modest everywhere else. Um, and sometimes if we need to be looking for hemorrhoids and the cheeks need to be separated, then you might get really got to have the exposure there so you can separate the cheeks. That sounds so grotesque when I say it, but believe it or not, it's actually life-saving. I hope that didn't gross anyone out. Um, so, and Wendy, I agree. Colonoscopies are done respectfully. Um, now, the question about radionucleotides rolling around the planet, they are out there. 
that might be responsible for some of these. But we know that the thyroid is, in, is exquisitely sensitive to developing cancer from radiation. And as far as we can tell, thyroid cancers have not grown as fast in the young individuals as much as these cancers. So that might not be as much of a risk, but it's a very, very good thought. Can they do an intubation if I have sleep apnea during my, during my endoscopies? We rarely do intubations for colonoscopies or EGDs. We manage the sleep apnea with our other anesthesia techniques. Breastfeeding is a very, this is a hugely fascinating question. We don't know the answer, but a recent study showed that breastfeeding is associated with an increased risk of breast cancer. But once again, is that strong enough to discourage women from breastfeeding despite its known benefits? Not as of yet, but it's something you can discuss with your doctor, absolutely. Uh, and Marianne, hope you are so welcome. And thank you, Heidi, as well. Hey, Becky, good to see you on here. Uh, cancer is so rare in Japan, says Carol. You know, there are some cancers that are more common in the East. Stomach cancer is one of them. So... Japanese lifestyles certainly are much healthier than American Western uh, lifestyles in many, in many examples, not necessarily for mental health. I have a whole video on that when I traveled to Japan and they do, they don't, they're not immune to cancer. And certainly these risk factors can also come to play in Japan. Everyone needs to be vigilant and advocate for their health, but I'm certainly an advocate for the Japanese lifestyle as a whole. Uh, and I'm trying to keep up with all your questions. There's so many great questions. I'm so sorry to hear this. My brother died of cancer because they didn't look at his anus. He had four scopes. Well, this is why we want to take a good look and separate those cheeks. Once again, I don't mean to be vulgar, but that is the reality of how these colonoscopies are done. Uh, menopause is rare in Japan. It's not rare. It happens. All Japanese women will go through menopause, but it is at a later age on average, something like two years later than in the West. Very, very interesting question. And can I just poop in the box thing? Is it accurate? Lizzie, it's a very good question. It is becoming increasingly accurate to detect for either blood or other markers of cancerous cells in your poop. But the gold standard, meaning the one that's going to be the what we define as the most sensitive and specific, is still going to be the colonoscopy. So if you're at risk, I would probably not opt for one of these little poop smear samples, but go for the real deal. It sounds so, once again, I, I don't mean to be vulgar saying this about butt cheeks and the real deal, but you get what I mean. <laughs> um, I wore a thyroid shield. Yes, Wendy, I'm happy you did. Those thyroid shields are important because of that radiation risk that we talked about. Did this study control for socioeconomic issues? If you cannot afford formula, you are more likely to be breaded, <laughs> breaded, hence you have a bad diet. It sounds like a study that says, yeah, I hear you. And that's why it's an association study. It is something that increases uh, <laughs> cause for study, but not enough in the opinion of most professionals to warrant against breastfeeding. I'm totally with you on this. Uh, Lynch syndrome, Tirsa, you absolutely need to speak with your doctor about being screened at an earlier age and more often because of that risk of the hereditary um, influence on developing cancer. I'm so happy that you're reaching out and advocating for yourself. Danielle, 68 year old male, Daniel, pardon me. Yes, it is time for colonoscopy based on the recommendations in the United States. Does constipation cause cancer? No, but we believe that it might predispose to diverticuli, which are the little out poppings in the end of your colon, is that associated with cancer? Well, it can be associated with inflammation and ongoing inflammation if those little poppings get infected could theoretically increase the risk of cancer. So bottom line, you want to have a diet that has adequate fiber, which most Western diets are horribly deficient in. All right, last question here. Two in one, I've had nausea, vomiting, dysphagia, even after my surgery, I throw up in the mouth and almost aspirate. Boxer mom, I'm so sorry to hear that. Please talk to your anesthesiologist about your nausea and vomiting so that they can give you medications or the scopolamine patch 
or change their anesthesia techniques to minimize that risk of happening again in the future. If you learned something new, do please hit that like button and share what you learned with others so you can advocate for yourself and minimize the risk of these cancers, especially in your friends who are under the age of 55, where the prevalence of these two cancers in particular are increasing. There's so much we can do. You have more power over your health than you've probably ever been told. Until next time.